Let me make like Barry Allen and speed straight to the point. The Flash is actually good. And not just good, but sort of great. Legitimately, without question, this is one of my favorite movies in all of the DCEU. I would put this on the same level as Zack Snyder's Justice League in terms of quality, though the two are total tonal opposites and completely different experiences. They're both up there, but they're, they're up there for different reasons. There is just so much to love with this one. Not only is this a celebration of the entire DCEU slash Snyderverse up till this point in time, but toward the end it acts as a love letter to the overall DC movie lore. It is a send-off of everything that came before it, while clearing the timeline for what's about to come. The movie has a ton of fan service, but I don't think it ever feels too self-indulgent. There's definitely a sequence at the end that is unnecessary, but it's greatly appreciated. They don't overdo it, they do just enough and then they move past it. Actually, I think they tease you with just enough of those member berries to get you feeling all nostalgic. And it never comes at the expense of the actual plot. If anything, it sort of adds to it. Because we see how far the crisis in the multiverse goes. And all those who are affected by it. But we'll get into that later. One thing I really loved about this movie was the way that it flowed. The pacing was perfect. For a movie about the fastest man alive, it sure knew when to slow down and take its time. This has actually been an issue I have with almost all of these DC films. They keep rushing from plot point to plot point, and it takes a toll on the final product. Sometimes slow and steady wins the box office race. Although I guess technically not this time, because it, it did not do well. The story felt very fluid and natural. I genuinely felt like I was watching these events unfold as they transpired. I know that that's a weird thing to comment on, but I've seen the rest of this movie universe and I think it deserves to be pointed out when it's done right. The narrative isn't hidden, it's very evident. You don't have to go searching for the plot in a sea of setups for future installments. This movie has its own story to tell and sees to it that it's told. No one ever overstays their welcome. I think we get just enough time with each character to get a sense of who they are, what they want, and maybe we get to see them do a cool thing or two. Honestly, the way that these elements were juggled is very well done. Especially when compared to previous movies in this movie lineup that mismanage and drop the ball on projects with significantly less elements to it than this one has. While the stakes are high and the tone is mostly serious, there are still plenty of laughs to be had along the way. The comedy hits all the right beats, which again, isn't always the case in these movies. There's a funny factor, but the movie doesn't venture into strictly comedic territory. Everything about this just kinda clicks. The Flash movie has a great amount of heart. It was a lot better than I hoped, and way better than I expected. Many people had the joke going into this movie that it's more of a Batman movie than a Flash movie, but after seeing it, that couldn't be further from the truth. Yes, there are an abundance of Batman. Michael Keaton is all over this movie, both in the actual movie and more importantly in marketing for obvious reasons. Ben Affleck is all over the beginning of this movie. And we even get one or two more familiar bat faces along the way. But this movie isn't confused at all about its identity. First and foremost, this is a Flash movie. Barry Allen is both the focus and the heart of this movie. We follow his plight and sympathize with his actions. Despite Michael Keaton's return obviously overshadowing Ezra Miller's first solo outing, it's clear that he's just a big player in this game. But here, Ezra is the star, for better or worse. And it is both of them in this movie. Now look, I normally would have skipped this movie. And if I'm being honest, I only went into it for two reasons and both of them were Batman. And while I loved seeing the return of the Batman from Batman Returns, I'll stop using that pun, I promise. And as great of an addition as he was, he wasn't the driving force in this movie, even if the advertising really wanted you to believe that he was. The Flash is what made The Flash so great. Speaking of Ezra Miller, though often I wish I wasn't, this is easily the best performance we've gotten out of this character in these movies. It doesn't feel canonically conflicting to what's come before, but these events feel like they offer up more of a nuanced take on the character. And it does so naturally. Without contradicting the previous iteration of this character, it just takes those elements and expands on it, shows another dimension to this character. We see him not as the fast-talking, fast-running comedic relief, but as a three-dimensional person. 
uh, well, uh, people. We get a lot more insight into who he is as a person and what it is that makes him tick. Never once does this take on the character contradict what we've already learned about him. It instead adds to and elaborates on that blueprint, using the previous films as the foundation for this character. Not working outside it, but working with it. Previously when we've seen Barry Allen, it's sort of been through the view of others. He's the really annoying, obnoxious, socially oblivious chatterbox whose mouth moves faster than his mind. A fact that he himself will comment on and call himself out for in this movie. But here we see through his eyes. We see how overwhelming the hero job and just life in general can be for him. We have a better view of his stress and a greater idea of his trauma. This does wonders to really humanize Barry and make him feel like a real person instead of a punchline. He's as hopelessly awkward as he's always been, but when we're shown that experience from his perspective, it's a completely different dealing. His frantic nature is still present, but it's not being played for laughs. You're now kind of getting a better understanding of how overwhelming having these powers and this responsibility can be. Despite the fact that he's the fastest man alive, he can still never seem to get where he's needed in time. And that's because he's needed in so many different places at once. And, try as he might, even the Flash has limits. He's a social outcast without any real friends, as he's avoided interaction to instead pursue justice. Spending his days obsessing over earning his father's freedom, trying to right a wrong time has provided him. As previously established, Barry's father is serving a life sentence for the murder of his mother. Figuring out that he can speed through the very fabric of time and reality, he decides to try to go back and right that wrong. But instead of fixing his timeline, he's knocked into another that he's helped create. One where his father isn't in jail, where his mother isn't in a grave, and where another him already exists. The movie is very, very loosely based on Flashpoint. The story structure and about two or three major plot points and story beats are repeated from that previous story. Except here, as opposed to being an accurate adaptation or a true retelling of the tale, these moments are altered to better fit in with this universe. So it's almost like this movie is taking previously established lore and doing its own thing with it. Ultimately, they really tell their own story. If you were hoping for an accurate adaptation of Flashpoint, well, you're going into the wrong movie. But the good news is, is that there is a movie out there for you. Instead of an accurate adaptation of Flashpoint, The Flash is kind of telling its own Flash story using the formula of Flashpoint. The returning elements don't feel like re-recycled trash. They're welcome comebacks that add to the product and the gravity of major moments in the movie. Like with the original story, Barry loses his powers, and with the aid of Batman, recreates the accident that gave him those unique abilities. As opposed to entering a timeline where Thomas Wayne, Bruce's father, becomes Batman following the tragic loss of his son, Flesh enters a timeline where there's a different Bruce Wayne that becomes Batman following the tragic loss of his parents. As opposed to finding this universe's Superman imprisoned and malnourished being kept away from the sun, they find a Supergirl imprisoned and malnourished kept away from the sun. So in a lot of ways, it's the same story with different characters or different versions of characters. And yet the final product feels tonally and totally different. Most importantly, instead of taking the place of his other self in that timeline, Barry exists in a timeline with his other self. Say what you will about Ezra Miller the person, Ezra Miller the actor at least deserves some credit here. Not only excelling at one, but two versions of Barry Allen on the main cast. What I find most interesting is the way that the story is set up. It sort of acts as a proper first introduction to Barry, even though this is technically our second or third time seeing him, while showing how far the characters come since this movie universe's actual first introduction to the character. Because of this, we get to see how the Barry Allens compare and contrast. They're the same person at a different age from separate timelines with different living experiences. They're completely identical, but also distinctly their own. Not only does the movie do a solid job of making each Barry unique, but Ezra Miller has great chemistry with himself. Themselves? I, I, this is a little too confusing. I don't know. 
Seeing their bond grow over the runtime is kind of endearing. You can easily forget that this isn't two actors, but instead one person playing off themselves. Outside of the few occasions where they're speaking to each other but not in each other's line of sight, or the few frames where you can see that it's Ezra Miller and an actor deep faked to also be Ezra Miller. They almost feel like siblings by the time we get to the movie's climax. The Flash really fleshes Barry out as a character. We learn more about him as a person, and we're finally let in and made aware of his origin story, including flashbacks not only to his tragic origin, but to previously established events in the DCEU that audiences didn't know that he was a part of. Seeing the Flash during the events of Man of Steel, and seeing his inability to save the victims of Zod's attacks, adds another layer of tragedy that this character has seen, as well as establishing and solidifying Barry's desire to help others. It's good to see that this has always been a part of the character, even before he met up with the rest of the League. What's really impressive is how the movie manages to address the character's past and present up until this point in time, while still pushing the timeline and the narrative forward. We learn about the character on a much more intimate level, learning about the accident that created him and what it is that motivates him. The only thing that's really missing here is how he got the name The Flash, which, spoiler alert, he got from the CW's Flash. It would have been great to include that scene here in some capacity, because it's kind of a major moment for this character if you're unaware of that other universe is completely lost in translation. It also shows off a whole new slew of creative abilities that come with Barry Allen's powers. I like that we get to see his power evolve. He's not just the guy who can run fast, he's the guy who can phase through solid structures. He's the guy who can create static shock force lightning. He can time travel, he can wreak havoc on the multiverse. It's nice to see that he's not just a one note trope here. But the Flash isn't alone in being multiplied. There are multiple Batman throughout as well. Ben Affleck returns to the role of Batman, but it feels... off, sort of. He isn't using the voice modulator at all in this one, so it's weird hearing his Batman voice without... his Batman voice. But what's even weirder is that he never stops doing his Batman voice, even when he's in public and not being Batman. His facial reactions also feel very over the top. The whole performance feels considerably different than it did in the previous films. I'm not necessarily saying that he did a bad job, I just think that he made some choices that are interesting to discuss. I wonder what it was that prompted this change. If you were ever yearning for a solo Ben Affleck Batman outing, the opening of this movie gives you a taste of what could have been. Because there's a big action sequence featuring this version of the Dark Knight. Bruce's speech on how scars make you who you are and that there's nothing wrong with Barry was maybe the most Batman thing they've ever asked Ben Affleck to do. It's honestly in my top three favorite moments of Ben Affleck's tenure as the Dark Knight. I know some people have some problems with the suit in this one, but I personally do not. The breastplate comes out a little bit too much for me, but aside from that, I actually kind of dug it. I'm glad that we finally got to see a big screen iteration of the classic blue and gray Batman costume. It's a highly underrated look that deserves a lot more love. It's nice and new to the palette. But I also appreciate that changes like this also reflect the passing of time. I think small details like this do a great job of subtly showing that events have transpired between movies. And when Barry alters the timeline, he brings back a different returning Batman. Michael Keaton is everything you'd hope he'd be. He's still very much the same Batman, just a little bit older and a lot less hopeful. Keaton's still got it. It was a little trippy seeing him in this movie universe, just because I wasn't used to seeing this Batman in this much blatant action. There's some truly awesome sequences featuring this character, and a lot of visuals surrounding him that are great. The character is still just as smart and socially indifferent as he ever was. One thing I'd like to point out is recently I made a video on Michael Keaton as Batman, where I noted that Alfred was what grounded him to reality, and without him, he'd surely become completely isolated. This movie literally confirms that. Not only is Bruce a rugged recluse, but Alfred even gets a name drop, and it kind of seems like they're hinting at this exactly. 
He's a shut-in, a hermit, which seems fitting for an old man living in a new world that's lost his way. At this stage of life, Bruce has already devoted his best years, and then some extra, into fixing his city. And has seen some success. He's created a city that no longer needs Batman. A world where he no longer needs to be Batman. So he spends the rest of his existence locked away from the city he helped save. The truth is, is that he's comfortable with this existence. His job is done. He has nothing left to do but rest until that's all he can do. But he still jumps back into costume again, against his better judgment. Because he knows now that he's needed. That is the selfless savior from the shadows that I know. Though there aren't too many shadows in this one. We'll get into that in a bit. Ultimately, Bruce comes out of retirement upon realizing that he and Barry share the same plight. The bond between the two is believable, but it's also a little underexpressed just due to everything else going on at the time. In a weird way, Barry sort of takes over the Robin role, as being a younger hero being taken under the Bat's wing, and a friendship forming between the two that begins from them sharing the same pain. It's interesting seeing this Batman in the mentor role as that's a route that's been planned, but never actually explored with Keaton's Batman. But I think he lives up to the expectation. He feels like a father supporting their child, even if they're not necessarily on board with all of their decisions. He acts as an annoyed, begrudging leader. If nothing else, I appreciate that this movie had Keaton return as Batman and gave him a chance to interact with other heroes, bringing back something old to do something new with it. There's a lot of references to this Batman and his line of continuity. Barry, too, at one point finds a bag of laughter, which is the chattering teeth that were on Joker's corpse. Batman also asks his company how much they weigh to figure out if his tech is usable in that given instance. That's a callback to the first Batman movie with Vicki Vale. It's also nice to know that no matter how old he gets, his sense of fashion never changes. Still wearing the same ascots and mechanic suits. That's, uh, that's definitely a choice. I like that the movie pointed out the parallels between both Batman, like having Barry 2 and original Bruce reenacting the Batarang toss from Justice League with a frying pan, or having both iterations repeat the same phrase. Maybe some other time. Maybe some other time. Despite the fact that they're given the same lines, their delivery is completely different, which is pretty symbolic of the multiverse in general. The same, but different. Even his relationship with Barry and how quick he takes a liking to the speedster just goes to show that despite their differences, both Ben Affleck and Michael Keaton are Batman. They have similar qualities. They enjoy a lot of the same things. I guess you could say that they're the same, just split down the middle. Then you have Supergirl, who is nothing like the Supergirl I know in any way, shape, or form. She doesn't really look like the standard Supergirl. As a matter of fact, she looks a lot more like the Supergirl from the Injustice series, who is in fact not Kara Zor-El. This is different, but it's one of those cases where different isn't always bad. I like this original take, and I thought that there were a lot of benefits from going the route less traveled here. For one, I feel like I'd have an easier time believing this version of Supergirl being related to this version of Superman. I also think having a version of Kara that the pseudo-Justice League and the audience don't know adds to the feeling of complete chaos and overall unpredictability of this crisis. The brief time we get with this character and this actress in the role is enough to make an impact on the narrative and make an impression on those watching. I also really love seeing her in the part because of how passionate she was about playing that part. That's the exact type of person you want in the role. I personally feel if it means something to them, it'll probably mean more to us. The character showed complete vulnerability that, given the circumstances, is well justified. Some people complain that she acts in a violent manner that Supergirl would never act in, but I think they're really missing the context of this story to harp on whatever alleged slights they can find and pick apart. And that's coming from me. This is a Supergirl who's been taken captive since she arrived on the planet imprisoned in a solitary chamber to isolate her from the sun, making her completely powerless and weak. She hasn't lived the life that her cousin has, 
brought up by good people who instill moral. She hasn't even lived the life that her comic book counterpart has. She's only seen the cruelty of mankind and Kryptonians. When she's first brought into battle, she learns that her infant cousin, who she sworn to protect, was killed before she got to the planet. The rage within her is warranted. It fits. She's reluctant to help humans because she's been shown the worst sides of humanity, believing her experiences to be indicative of the majority. But when she's given a chance to see the good in human beings, and witness the horrors that they're up against, she makes the right decision and defends the people of this planet, doing so knowing that she's not fully healed, still facing the effects of decades of malnourishment and intentional neglect. Sure, she got up to charge in the sun like the solar-powered superhero that she is, but I think it's fair to say that she's not entering the battlefield at 100%. As a matter of fact, it's ultimately this decision that costs her her life. Continually. I wish a little more time was devoted to the character, especially considering that it's more than likely that this will be the last time we see the actress in the part but I still think just enough time was given to Superman's cousin for us to appreciate her. Surprisingly, there isn't a whole lot of closure with either of these characters. Their send-off feels more than a little unceremonious. It was definitely a shocking moment for sure. You definitely don't see it coming. But I think this may have been a misguided step because it almost feels like the movie undervalues those characters' inclusions. They're there, they wow the audience, and then they're not so much as given a grand send-off. I don't know, that's, that's one of the things that always felt wrong to me about this movie. I know that this is because of reshoots and the restructuring of a cinematic universe and the proverbial creative gods in charge of it, but that doesn't make their dismissal feel any more reasonable. What I truly love is that this movie doesn't really have a main antagonist. They're a returning villain, sure, you have General Zod and not Ursa, but they're not really the movie's main villains. Because the movie doesn't really have a real villain. Even that dark flash that the figure line spoiled before the movie's release? I wouldn't constitute him as a full-fleshed villain, so much as a plot device to keep the story moving. Dark Flash is essentially time-warped Barry too, who kept going back in time in an effort to save Batman and Supergirl while also still trying to keep the timeline in which his mother wasn't brutally murdered and his father wasn't blamed for said murder. Dark Flash is born out of Barry's need to save everybody in the face of reality. That that's an impossible feat. Running rampant in the Speed Force without the fear of consequence. What is that age-old phrase? The path to hell is paved with good intents? Dark Flash is not Barry turned bad or Flash turned foe. It's the Flash blinded by the Flash itself, focusing so much on trying to save others that he's not realizing he's destroying himself and the multiverse in the process. He's not the bad guy. He's a hero misguided into being a problem, lost in the darkness of his own despair, desperately trying to save already fallen friends. Barry is quite literally his own worst enemy here. We're shown that power without guidance can distort even the greatest of heroes. It's a cautionary tale and a reoccurring theme that this movie universe has established. Heroes can be corrupted. The Flash didn't turn bad. He just lost sight of the greater good in trying to achieve the greater good, while being wrapped up in rescuing the casualties along the way. In trying to save everybody, he's lost himself. When Barry sees the monster he's become, he sacrifices himself to save himself. Because only he could solve his own problems. I love the window dressing of this movie. The cameos, the easter eggs, the extra add-ons, the love extended to the rest of not only the DCEU, but the DC movie and show multiverse as well. Wonder Woman was a nice surprise. Though in hindsight, I guess she really shouldn't have been as she's sort of become the one constant in this series. Her time on screen is short, but sweet. It's a much unneeded, but much appreciated cameo, saving Batman, Holiday, and all of Gotham City. Spending just enough time to have some friendly banter and flirt a little with Bruce. 
I never felt like the fan service here was excessive or gratuitous. The vast majority outside of Michael Keaton's return to the role were condensed to just a few minutes of screen time and reduced down to just one scene. This fan service also felt well warranted. They're not just there to be there. Their appearance serves a purpose in showcasing the chaos that Flash is unleashed on the multiverse, and showing the extent and effects of Barry running roughshod over reality. It also gives some sense of closure in certain cases, like showing Christopher Reeve's Superman and Helen Slater's Supergirl interact for the first time ever. Their movies were always set in the same canon, but neither ever appeared in the other one's movie. Despite the less than stellar PS3 graphics, there's still something heartwarming to me about this, at least finally getting to see the two stand side by side. It felt equally satisfying seeing Nicolas Cage don the cape and costume. Cage has always been a major Superman fan, dishing out some serious money to own the first ever Superman comic book. He was also scheduled to play the part in a movie that ultimately would be retooled and made into Superman Returns. It was good to see the Superman from Superman Lives finally live, and furthermore, getting to see him fight a giant spider. As we're never getting that Nicolas Cage Superman movie, I will say that this scene is a very nice consolation prize. George Reeves' Superman from the old serials gets some love here too, which may just be the most unasked for easter egg, but it was still nice to see DC's past being praised. George Reeves is really an unsung hero in on-screen depictions of DC characters. There's more to this minor mention, but I think that's best saved for later. It was, however, a strange choice to showcase a never-before-seen original Flash in his universe. I also question the decision in making his universe black and white, because while yes, the original episodes were in black and white, later on they would be presented in color. There's a little love in passing given to the passed on Adam West, as we're briefly shown a glimpse of his universe. I've seen a lot of people mock this, not for the sentiment, but instead for the fact that they believe the effects team somehow forgot to give Batman ears. But he has them. They're there. You can just barely make them out, but yeah, they, they exist. Batman 66 depicted the character as having itty bitty stubs on the top of his mask. So at that angle when cloaked in shadow, you're not gonna see a whole lot of them. That's not an error on the part of the effects team. I thought all this played into the plot nicely, and most importantly felt purposeful. It was a nice nod to the past in a movie that was trying to set up a brand new future. The movie feels like it has a story to tell, and despite it being about time travel and multiverse, I actually think it's one of the most coherent DCEU movies ever made. I was adamant about seeing the movie for Batman, all two of them, but I honestly think Ezra did a great job of carrying the film all on their own. All three of them. I think there's a lot of good to this movie. The humor worked when it needed to work, and it acted as a love letter to the past. But that's not me saying that the movie is the perfect picture. There are still plenty of problems. And in part two, I plan on covering all of them. So if you like this video and would like to see that part two, talking about all the bad in The Flash, let me know in the comment section below by leaving a comment saying, Quick as a flash, Commissioner.